Hello, and welcome to the Leader Bath Show. How are you today? I'm excited to be here. I'm five minutes late because I had some connection issues. So if it uh, goes out, I will come back. <laughs> and today is how to keep your cool when people make mistakes, when people mess up. And I think it's a very relevant topic because... Well, anger is a useful sometimes emotion, is a very common emotion, is a very human emotion. If we don't learn to manage it, especially at work, uh, our results, our performance, our business, our reputation are all in danger. And I wanted to share some tips. So as you are coming on, say hi. If you're even uh, joining the replay, say hi. I'd love to to come and interact in the comments. And I do have some notes actually to help me not forget every anything. And this is going to be a practical session. I'm going to share with you eight, seven, eight strategies I have used, my clients have used to manage agar in the workplace. But before we go into that, I wanted to discuss why is this even important, right? We feel anger when we feel threatened. And this is an evolutionary response. We, we have all these hormones of anger in order to fight. Fear helps us flight. Anger helps us fight. And if we have to fight with someone, an intruder that comes into our home, anger is a very useful emotion. Let's say we cannot flee. We have to fight to protect our family, to protect our, our own integrity. This is a very useful emotion. Also, what I've noticed is a very common trigger for anger is unfairness. And this is not just in humans. There's this very viral YouTube video that you have monkeys and you give the monkeys, uh, you have two monkeys and you give them cucumber and they love it and they're happy. And then the next day you go and give um, one monkey grapes and the other cucumber and the monkey that gets the cucumber, even if they were happy with the cucumber the day before, just looks at the cucumber, and throws it and feels this anger. So unfairness triggers ang anger a lot, even in animals. So that's something as leaders to bear in mind when we're doing our team's compensation. Fairness is even more important than uh, for their motivation, for their feeling settled in the role. Fairness is even more important sometimes from the, the how high the, the compensation is. Okay, so anger, triggered when we feel threatened, triggered uh, when we feel... There's some unfairness. There, there might be other triggers, but these are the two most commons, common ones that I have seen. And what's the problem? Like if we are in anger a lot for extended periods of time, this was not supposed to be for extended period of time, right? This was supposed to fight uh, for the domination <laughs> and then the anger needs to, to subside. And actually, I, I was listening from uh, Michael Neal, another story about animals that if there are two uh, animals in a group of the same type of animals, uh, I don't know, I didn't, I don't remember the example, let's say, whatever, deer. I don't think that was the example. And they fight, the two males fight for the domination, who will be the dominant uh, alpha male in the, in the group. The winner keeps the testosterone. So the, even if the winner wins, they keep some of this anger hormones, let's go get it. And the reason is they there might be another challenger. Well, the, the person, the, the animal who lost the fight, they, they have all the hormones. They feel quite disappointed because this is the nature made it. So they actually go somewhere, lick the woods. They don't go on a fight again. So they don't feel anger. So it's. I thought it was kind of interesting. Michael Neal was talking about how discouragement works biologically. But in my topic today, if you're winning a fight, let's say you're perceiving all the work competition, uh, you might even sustain the anger a little bit longer, all these hormones of let's go, let's do it, let's, a little bit of aggression, which is interesting to bear in mind that sometimes winning uh, can 
make you angry and go get it for longer. The problem is when we feel anger and there's not a real danger, um, it's, I always like the metaphor is like drinking poison and waiting someone else to die. It's very harmful for long term for our body, for our mental health to be angry and, and staying in that anger. And, and it's very tempting to do so. And we'll discuss about that. Um, also, as leaders in the workplace, if we are angry, um, we created a psychologically unsafe environment. People don't bring the mistakes. They're not sharing them. So we don't know in order to do anything about it. They will not bring dissenting ideas. So we won't have diversity of thought to make the best decisions. What's even worse, when we are angry, our team gets anxious, being afraid of our wrath. And they make even more mistakes because when they are anxious and in fear, the prefrontal cortex um, shuts down. And actually, for us as well, when emotions are high, intelligence is low. That's how nature designed it. So when we are angry, our intelligence is low and their intelligence, if, if we trigger fear or anger at them, is low. So that's not the best recipe for a great business. And also, I want to bring this at home. And especially for those of you who have kids, I'm, I'm preparing in a week, I'm launching my parent path uh, experiences for, for leaders and pup who want to be great parents at the same time and how to balance this all. So I'm always now, when I'm talking, I'm thinking the examples, how does this apply to leadership? How does this apply to parenting? I think the stakes are even higher. If we lash out on our kids, um, because they are so dependent psychologically and physically on us, for them, it is perceived as a very existential threat when their caregiver lashes out and becomes aggressive. The person that gives them the love and the nurturing is the person that, becomes the aggressor, even if it's just, uh, obviously I'm, I'm discussing about physical violence, even if it's an emotional aggression, and it can really dysregulate their um, nervous system and, and can be stored there as a traumatic event. So the, the stakes of how we can harm ourselves, our business, our teams, and our family are really high. That's why we're here. Let's sort this out. Let's sort this out. Okay, and I will share some. And by the way, the reason I'm sharing this, you often teach what you most want to learn. And and I've been grappling with this um, recently. And that's why I'm talking about this too. This is what I did. This is what I worked. This is what I didn't. And I want to share what I learned in the process. Are you ready? Uh, write in the comments if you are ready to go into the eight strategies I'm going to share today about how to keep your cool. All right, let's do this. The first one is try to get into other people's shoes, the people who trigger your anger. And I will give you an example. I went this Monday, as this as I was posting this event, uh, this little bath show I was going to do on Thursday, I went to my GP, my doctor, it's public health system in England, to do a routine test. So going 11 a.m. and I say, I'm here for the test, 11 a.m. I had booked an appointment and they say, well, the receptionist, you're booked for Friday at 3. I'm like, no, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm booked for Monday at 11. And then they said, oh, yeah, we booked you with the wrong nurse. And that's why we changed you on Friday. And I'm like, you didn't think of telling me I cannot make Friday. Friday. And then this, there's this delay because there are phone calls. I have a very important meeting at one. And then they say, okay, we booked you at 1140 with another nurse that can do the test. Uh, but we'll tell them you're here now. Don't worry. Take a seat. And then I'm sitting in that chair and it is 11.40, like 40 minutes later, I was supposed to go in and out for the appointment, do the test. I had a very important meeting at one. And, and then it's 12. I've been waiting there for an hour. And I'm feeling the anger rising, right? And the anger in that situation is rising from thinking. And my thinking is, 
uh, I was thinking for the poor women there, they are incompetent, they don't care, they're losing productivity, they don't care about p- people's losing work. Um, like I'm, I'm bringing all this narrative and I, I'm <laughs> bloating with self-righteousness and anger and I feel I've wasted all this time and I have to go for the meeting and I have to come here and waste time again. And like the anger, I can feel the anger rising. And what helped me at this moment is try to get in those women's shoes, right? You're a receptionist in a public GP office in England. This lady was not her fault. I, I I hadn't booked my appointment with her. She tried to book me to fix it. The nurse was being extremely late with other patients. So it was not the receptionist's fault. Like when I was not thinking rationally when I was feeling angry, right? I was demonizing the receptionist as not caring, being incompetent uh, and all those things. But in reality, there was none of those things. Yes, there was a mistake another colleague had made. This lady was tr- tried to fix it. And I think maybe her mistake was not managing my expectations. She told me, I'll tell her, I'll text the nurse uh, that you're here earlier. But obviously the nurse never saw the text, et cetera. So my expectations that I will be seen before 1140. And then it's I, I was seen 1220, which is again, good. <laughs> I've gone to the emergency rooms and I've waited five hours in a public um, health system in England. So not that bad. They are overworked. Probably their, their pay is very low. This is a free service. I should be grateful to even have this service for free, living in a country that offers this for free. So getting into this person's shoes, that they're doing their job, they're doing the best they can, they have to deal with overwork, low pay, and they're still showing up and trying to serve those patients. Like this really helped shift that anger. So that's what very powerful technique. Try to relax and try to get into those other people's shoes. Um. Then there's this phrase that has been a rescuer for me when I'm feeling angry. And the phrase, I heard it from my mentor Melanie and later, is, is a moment of self-righteousness worth compromising my energetic frequency? And what I've noticed when I do feel angry with someone There is a lot of self-righteousness. That's why it is so tempting because the more angry, the more we work ourselves up. The reason why it's so alluring and tempting is because at this moment, we feel superior than the other person. We feel we are right. They are wrong. We have the moral high ground. Let me just stop my phone from... um, making any noises this should be stopped let me just close the phone entirely just do, does some oh, random notifications even if i have it on silent i haven't figured this out okay let me say this again because it's very important when we are angry it is often so tempting to feel superior, to get the moral high ground. And because that's so good for our ego, we're just saying, oh, these people, they're either incompetent, they don't care. And I'm a business owner, so when I have bad service somewhere, and I'm a very customer-focused business owner, I started marketing, I was in sales all my career, then I'm in coaching, I'm very customer-centric in my philosophy. But what happens is when I don't get service, a good service from another supplier, I go into the self-righteousness. Like these people do not uh, care about their customers. They're not as good at their job. And at this moment, I feel superior. I'm a better, like in the my ego is feeling satisfied because in the background, I'm saying I'm a better business owner than those guys. But it is very unpleasant feeling. Like you know when you're thinking nonsense because your body will tell you. You you will feel agitated. You won't feel happy and at peace and joy, joyful. So a lot of the times you will be right. You'll be angry and you will have every right. And the way to let go of that anger 
is to say, like, is this moment of self-righteousness as sweet and tempting as it is of me feeling I'm right, I'm right, and sticking to it and really working ourselves up? Is it worth it at compromising your ener energetic frequency? We are onto big things in the world. We're onto big things. We have a big purpose. We have a big vision. We have dreams. We're here to do some work. Will I let someone's bad service really compromise my energetic frequency and, I, and I'm making a mountain out of a molehill and I'm staying there really feeling bad and angry and self-righteous? No, no, I let that go. I don't want that energy. It's not worth it. I let that go as, as quickly as I can shift it. I'm not talking about suppressing anger or suppressing emotions. But when I say is it worth it? No, it's not. In most cases, sometimes we get angry for something that's so insignificant. Like, like last time I had to use that phrase, it was a cleaning service that they had left some towels in my home and the towels had rotten. They, they put them in the um, washing machine and I came back from my trip and the towels had rotten. Okay, unpleasant, awful. They were wrong. But in the big scheme of things, would I let some rotten towels like really compromise the way I show up in the world, the way I show up in my programs with my clients, in my community? Like I'm there feeling angry about some rotten towels. No. This moment of self-righteousness, as sweet as it is for our ego, is not worth it. Okay. I think I've made my point here. Let me know what you think. And let's move to the next strategy. I used that recently and it worked like a charm. I felt angry about something that had happened, but I needed to shift that energy very quickly because I had to show up to record a lesson for my program. It was the New Year, New Frontier, uh, which we finished last week. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And so the, my first impulse is I call my mom because my mom will listen. And it felt so tempting to just call my mom and talk about the thing. But that often makes us even angrier if we are resuscitating what happened with someone. Sometimes it will help us soothe us. We talked about this. We feel soothed. And I, actually, I couldn't find my mom. It was early in the morning. And I'm like, what do I do? I need to... So usually, when I talk to someone... Uh, it helps me, like my husband, my mom, my coach. I didn't have that option. I needed to record the lesson before the kids wake up and because then I had sessions and things to do. And then I, I went into the topic solutions. I have no affiliate partnership. I just want to thank those people. It, it's an app with topic meditations and I had to upgrade. I've used them in the past. I wasn't paying the premium. I upgrade, search, manage anger, tapping, and it was a nine-minute meditation called Manage Your Anger. And you just start tapping. And you say, I feel angry. Even if I feel angry, I accept my fellow, myself fully. And you tap like different points. And you just acknowledge the anger. And then within nine minutes, the anger had shifted with this topic meditation. It worked like a charm. I'm just sharing with, with you. And really, like I went to do the recording in the most beautiful energy. And I say, I can't believe I, I felt like Hulk 10 minutes ago. And now I have the most beautiful, calm, centered energy to record this audio for my coaching program. So in case of emergency, tapping, somehow it works. I'm not a tapping expert, but I'm a fan now, especially after what happened. All right. The next strategy, and that's... That requires some courage, my friends. The next strategy is release old pain. That creates this current triggers. When is the strategy relevant? When you notice you are triggered by something that is relatively minor and your reaction relatively to what happened is disproportionate. What often this means is that there's something from your past, some pain that you have suppressed and you didn't release, you didn't experience, it was too uncomfortable, you pushed it down. This pain 
is trying to release through that anger. Let's say something minor happens. Um, someone uh, gives you, uh, I don't know, like a minor feedback. A lot of people are very reactive to feedback. They interpret it as huge rejection. And if you have like feeling really angry about a person who made a comment that you could have improved something and you feel really angry, I would sit with myself. I said, okay, this must be a trigger. My reaction is very disproportionate to what happened. Is there, what does the situation remind me of? And you might find something from your past, like the feeling of being rejected. It, you interpreted this feedback as being rejected and be accepted for who you are, maybe teased in school by your classmates and, and, and some kind of traumatic or painful event. And this pain is trying to release and you feel this rush of anger and emotion because this pain is like, oh, maybe it's my time to, to work my way through rather than carry it. So actually, when you remember the event or the pain, just allowing it and experiencing, okay, okay, there was some pain there. Let's say when my classmates at school were teasing me about this and it was very painful and you, you experienced the pain and, and after a while, and then just ex by experience, I mean the sensations. You don't have to um, relieve the event, right? You just allow the sensation in your body of the pain. And then sooner or later, depending on the time, it will start disappearing on its own. And maybe, just maybe, you will have unblocked, you have released something that you've been carrying around for decades and it was making you triggered by minor events and, and you were trying to live your life by avoiding the triggers instead of releasing that pain and then be free. Now you're free, you can show up at your work, not being afraid of feedback, come on, bring it on because I've released the pain. So I was avoiding feedback because I, I, I didn't want to poke this childhood pain but you don't have to anymore you have released it all right let's move to the next one do not use toxic behaviors and i've talked about this in my book called successful meetings what are the toxic behaviors so anger is a human emotion and it's okay to get angry at work by the way you can't ban anger. The, when the people get passionate or even angry, means that they care. What's not okay is personal attacks. And actually, what's not okay are four behaviors, which I'm going to share with you now. The toxic behaviors. And these behaviors originally originated uh, by research on married couples. So the couples that shown had shown those four behaviors, they would um, break up mathematically. So I'll tell you the four behaviors and you can save your marriage or your relationship and I'll eliminate the toxicity from your team. So this is two for one. Are you ready to hear what those four behaviors are? Let me know in the comments. So let's see. The first one, the first toxic behavior is blame. Saying this is your fault, like a personal attack. So I would say when something goes wrong, we need to be forward looking. How can we avoid, how can we see what happened to avoid this happening again? It can be personal blame on people. That's a toxic behavior. Second toxic behavior is sarcasm. And we know what sarcasm is, like this sneaky comments, not being really um, accurate about what you're saying. Like we, we know how toxic, I, I would say sarcasm is the most toxic behavior. Now I'm not talking about well-intentioned joking here or teasing. I'm talking like sarcasm. This is a toxic behavior. Those two, it would be easy to identify them, blame and sarcasm as toxic behaviors. They're very obvious. The next two, they're not that obvious. Third one is defensiveness. This one is the one that really triggers me and I need to release probably some pain. When someone makes a mistake, and I'm okay with people making mistakes, 
I've, I've worked one of my longest tenured partners uh, who has helped me for years. I hired him while I was still working at Google. So probably we've been together six years. Oh, one of my assistants from Philippines, he's made so many mistakes over the years, but he's brilliant. Like he'll make a mistake. I say, well, uh, I'm not going to reveal his name given this context. Um, hey, team member, you made this mistake. Or I, and, and he's always so brilliant at, yeah, sorry, you're right. It's not going to happen again. Very non-defensive attitude. When we are defensive, when I, there are other team members that will say, oh, you, you made this mistake, and they get very defensive, this is a toxic behavior. And by very defensive, either they uh, refuse they made a mistake or they, what happens very often it is that they will attack you. They will attack you. Instead. Like I remember I had changed something in one of my coaching programs and one of, uh, of my assistants, I told her I made that change. She, she missed the email, right? Uh, so she communicated wrongly with one client. I said, look, I had sent you an email. This is not the way we do it anymore. We did it like that. And the immediate reaction was, well, it's your fault for changing the product. So I'm like, this doesn't make any sense, but it was a person who always reacted with defensiveness. Like, I will attack you, like the best defense is attack. She would attack the person who told uh, her that made a mistake. So defensiveness is a toxic behavior. And the fourth one is stonewalling. And stonewalling means shutting down communication, not showing up to meetings, not replying to emails, that will be stonewalling in in a work environment and at home we know how stonewalling is. I'm not talking to you. Um, I'm ignoring you. I'm watching TV. This is a very toxic behavior, right? So it's okay to be angry. It's not okay to default in those four toxic behaviors. Criticism, sarcasm, defensiveness and stonewalling all right let's move to the next one the next one is manage expectations and this applies to you if you are an emotional person because i know i'm i've lived in the uk for 12 years <laughs> and many english people are very stiff upper lip that's also something you need to manage expectations when you hire people i'm an emotional person like it's very obvious for me to that although my decision making is very rational usually like I'm a T in decision making I will get super excited I will get super joyous I will get frustrated when things are going wrong I care deeply about my work so I will get frustrated when things are going wrong so me managing the expectations when people are coming in that I will be very like you will see emotions that doesn't give you permission to be disrespectful, to be unprofessional, none of that. Like, I, I will be emotional, but I will never, never, um, at least I hope so, <laughs> be disrespectful. Like, sometimes you might commit microaggressions that you never know about it. But one of my rules is when I'm having this business conversation, when I'm having the uncomfortable conversation of firing people, uh, after conflict, after disagreement, I would say, I want to have those conversations as if they were being live streamed on my LinkedIn profile. I'm, I'm live streaming on my LinkedIn profile now. And when I'm having a difficult conversation with a team member, I want to be the same. Would I be proud if this conversation was broadcasted to my LinkedIn network? Right? So from one side, you want to show up as your best self, as the leader who you are on those conversations. You don't want to lose control. On the other side, you need to allow for your humanity and and managing the expectations when you're hiring teams. I, I'm emotional. You'll see me. I care deeply about things. It can be okay. Or if you are the stiff upper lead person, I would also manage expectations about that. You will see me at some part, times. I am a very measured in my emotional reactions. I hope like you need to know that that doesn't mean anything about you it doesn't mean i'm stonewalling you i'm just that's the way i am managing expectations is also i will tell my closest team members when i'm having a bad day because i will not i don't want um 
sometimes like I will manage my energy quite a lot with my clients when I'm teaching, when I'm coaching people. And sometimes when I'm talking to a member of my team, I want to be a little bit lower in energy, especially if I'm having a bad day. But I don't want them to take it personally and think I'm, I, there's something wrong with them. So then I might say in the beginning of the meeting, I'm having a difficult day today because of this. I may be a little bit lower energy in our call. Um, don't take it personally. Managing expectations. All right. The next one, the next tip is related to this. Do not have a post-mortem conversation when something has went wrong. Don't have the conversation while you're still angry. If you can avoid it, sometimes you can't avoid it because, and this has been a relatively new <laughs> insight for me. And it sounds very obvious to you, but uh, um, six years, seven years ago, I was in Thailand and I wrote an article. I was in Thailand in a sabbatical with my family and I wrote an article, 10 reasons why sharing your anger immediately is magic. This is one of my most successful viral articles. And if you want to go and read it, you can go to the leaderpath.com slash blog search for the word anger. And this article, seriously, on Medium has gone wild. Whenever I post it, it's going wild, super viral. And I still stand behind that article for the people closest to you. I had identified 10 reasons why for your life partner, for your kids, you, you need to share immediately if something starts rising so you can nip it in the butt. Uh, so... <laughs> I remember back then I, I wasn't I was on maternity sabbatical. I was working very little. And I started feeling angry and I would share it with my husband. And most times, eight out of ten, it would be a misunderstanding. We'll clear it out, it would be gone. That was the key reason why I said, don't wait until you're feeding your anger with stories and things, and then just share it when it's just started at the beginning. And I will say, I'm feeling anger rising right now because you did this or and say, no, I didn't mean this. I meant the other thing. Oh, cool. And then we will solving all this problem. So it, it was a huge breakthrough of in personal relationships, sharing the anger. But then I started implementing this in my business. <laughs> and what happened was that I would see something that went wrong, like a wrong email sent to a client or a wrong email sent to an associate or something that I felt, oh, what's this? This, this? this is not right. And immediately call my team member. I was like, let me figure this out right now. Let's. And it's true that my theory that eight times out of 10 is a misunderstanding, it was accurate, right? Um, says, oh, no, I didn't mean this. I meant this. I was like, okay, perfect. Um, sorry, I, I got a little bit worked out about this. But then I realized emotionally <laughs> for my team members, having me calling them and say to try to sort this out before it grows on me and become resentful and I fit it with stories. That was my, like, it worked really well for me. I felt great with my team. But for them, it felt not safe. Like they, I will get the call. They would get the call, and they would feel that at this moment I I felt some emotion. That's why I was calling them. I'm feeling some emotion, and I want to sort this out, clarify what happened, right? And this didn't make them feel safe. So I need to probably do a next version of this article. I stopped doing that. So if I, for professional relationships, for especially for people who you know. They are not caught. They're defensive. You, I wait. If I feel any emotion about what happened, I don't call them because they can see the emotion of my voice. I'm not a person that I'm going to hide it. I will be professional, but it will be obvious. And I wait until my anger is over and we'll do a postmortem. I'll say, oh, okay, this happened. I will be more relaxed nervous system. And we will keep the conversation via email until then. And an email I can control that it doesn't look, um, there's anger there. And, and that's helpful because that's the whole thing of when we have the postmortem, I'm already not angry. We can easily be more constructive. How can we avoid this happening again or whatever? So this is my new insight. So learn from my mistakes. And the final, final 
tip, which is not a tip really, it's just a reminder. You are safe. When you are feeling angry, your body thinks it's being attacked, that you're in danger, and you're not really nine times out of ten. You're just your body just thinks you are. And just a reminder that this is really a minor thing. Even a month from now, you probably won't even remember. It just helps to soothe down your nervous system. So let's do a recap. Eight strategies, tips, ideas to keep your cool when people make mistakes. Try to get in other people's shoes. Remember the phrase, is a moment of self-righteousness worth compromising my energetic frequency? Try tapping an anger management EFT meditation for urgent, if you really, really urgently to shift your anger because you have something to do. Release old pain that causes present triggers. Do not use toxic behaviors. Shame. No, not shame. Blame. Um, sarcasm. Stonewalling and defensiveness. Manage people's expectations about your temperament or whether you're having a bad day. And by the way, now that I'm talking having a bad day, that's also something I'm thinking when I'm angry at people. That's the first one, getting through the shoes. Maybe they're just having a horrible day. You don't know what's happening in other people's lives. Maybe they did make a mistake, but maybe there's something so huge happening in their lives that if I knew, this mistake will be totally understandable. Um, then the next one, do not have the conversation, the post-mortem conversation after the mess has happened while you're angry, if you can avoid it. And reminder, you are safe. Let me know in the comments if this was useful. Let me know which one of the strategies most resonated with you. And I'll talk to you soon. I don't know. More, I like Thursday this time. Probably be live this next week, but we'll see. We'll see. You'll see it in the, on LinkedIn. It was a pleasure. And talk to you soon. Bye-bye.